This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on Farm Bureau Health Plans making it easy to get the health coverage you need for less than you think. Visit FBHP.com. I'm Mike Keith, joined by Amy Wells, and fresh off the Tour de France, Paul Burmeister, Mike? NBC Sports. Yes. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be here. Well, maybe we should explain why Paul's here <laughs> coming off the Tour de France. You know, I actually <laughs> prefer if we don't. Yeah, because. And just make it sound like we have these international amazing <laughs> guests. Well, it's true. Amy <laughs> said, Mike, we've got to get a guest on to talk Tour de France on the OTP. <laughs> That's the and one thing we've this. been Not missing. Not 100% <laughs> accurate. <laughs> Pleased to announce to the OT people that Paul Burmeister next month will be calling Titans preseason games on the Titans television network at Chicago, at Minnesota, home against New England, with his and our longtime friend Charles Davis. And Corey Curtis will be on the sidelines from WKRN. Uh, we, we are thrilled you're going to do this. I'm thrilled to be doing it. I think in the uh, in the contest of who is most thrilled here for the three of us, it is me. Good. But thank you for saying that. <laughs> Good. Well, I mean, people know you from NFL Network. They know you from NBC and the Olympics and the many things you've done for NBC. How many years in a row does this make now that you've been the lead voice of the Tour de France? Boy, back to 2016. So Eight. 16, yeah, there you go. You're a little better than I am. Eight. It's crazy, Mike. I never, I didn't follow cycling. I didn't grow up like aspiring to to work on things like the Olympics or Tour de France. But when you're in, inside the building at NBC, you, you get to, to do these kind of things. So um, never saw that one coming, but really happy to be, still are, be a part of it. Are you a cyclist? You know what? This is going to uh, hurt some of my street cred, oh, the good. people who watch the tour, but no, I'm not. Now, I have a bike. Uh, my wife and I and sons will get out and ride around, but anybody who is an actual cyclist, for me to put to be in that group would be an insult. So how do you prepare for a broadcast like that when it's, it's not something that you're super familiar with? Right. Yeah, Being at NBC has been so good that way because 10 years at NFL Network, I, I played football for as long as I could, so... It's very comfortable for me to talk about football, to look at football and then broadcast about it. But going from NFL Network to NBC, inside that building, we, we have every Olympic sport. We have a lot of soccer. We have the Tour de France. So I didn't know how much of the others I was going to be doing. But to do something like cycling at that level, uh, it was something that scared me a lot. I was all at once when my boss asked me to do it. This is awesome. I'm really scared because I don't know that much about it. So I kind of had to go down that road of talking to people who make it their living to, to think about cycling, to read everything I could, to listen to people say the names and talk about it. And that's how I kind of got started to, to being comfortable to go on, on live TV talking about a sport that I didn't grow up with. In the Olympics, where have you focused the majority of your attention since you've been at NBC? Yes, yeah, so I have done water polo uh, two different times in the, in the summer games and ski jumping in the winter. And just like with cycling, these aren't sports that I grew up with. I was just presenting with the challenge in the form of a, basically an instruction, you will be doing these sports. And I've kind of, I don't, I'm not comfortable enough saying I've become good at it, but I've become comfortable with getting an assignment of a sport that I didn't grow up thinking about playing or watching. And I kind of have a little formula that I follow to get to the point, like I said a moment ago, where the red light can go on and I can have the words come out of my mouth and I can trust that it's going to be at the very least okay. How much study do you have to do for those sports when you don't have that basic knowledge like you would of football or basketball or baseball? Yeah, all kinds of it. And I don't know the exact number, Mike, but if, if I can just back up a little bit. So when you and I are calling football, something that we've been doing for a long, long time, any action that happens on the field, you know exactly what it is. You know what a first down is. You know what the hash mark is. You know what the uprights are. These are things we've been thinking about our entire life. And then I get to water polo and – Every single rule, uh, the, the landmarks inside the pool, the rules, the history are things that have not been on my mind. So I really just, I read everything I can. I find out the five people in the United States who know the most about it, I get in touch with them. 
and I asked for their time. Hey, at some point in the next month, can we spend a half hour on the phone? I just want to listen to you and ask you some questions. Uh, those kind of things. I read as much as I can. I listen to it. I actually practice the words coming out of my mouth. My wife and my sons are used to me doing this. It used to be weird, but now I'm just up in my office saying names, um, you're saying things that happen in the pool or in ski jumping. So the first time that they actually come out of my mouth, it's not on live TV. I, I've said it a hundred different times at home by myself. So it's a nerdy, different kind of prep uh, than I would have for football or basketball. But I have found that when I do those kind of things for these sports that just kind of came into my lap, that I didn't have a lot of institutional knowledge of before, uh, that's how I practice and that's how I get to the point where I can go on the air and feel like it's going to go okay. That makes you quite a (laughs) renaissance man, though. I mean, it's not everybody who, even everybody in the sports broadcasting world can walk into a room and say, hey, what do you want to talk about? Basketball, football, baseball, water polo, ski jumping. I mean, it makes you a very broad um, kind of person who can fit into a lot of different rooms and a lot of different circles, which as a broadcaster, as a person who wants to remain in the world of sports and talk about a lot of different things has got to be a great skill to have. It is. And it's a little bit deceiving too, Amy, to be honest, because uh, even though I can go on the air and host a show or, or call that sport, I still don't feel anything like an expert. Like Mike and I can talk about football from now until the holidays and not run out of things to say. When it comes to something like the Tour de France or water polo in the Olympics uh, or the Premier League in soccer, which I've been working with for the last couple of seasons now, I still don't feel super comfortable. And I was talking to a group here before, and I feel comfortable enough to do it, uh, to do my job well. But this feeling of being, and I'm not afraid to say it, this feeling of being a little bit scared by a challenge is good for you as a broadcaster because it pushes you into the space where you're studying every last thing you can because you have this thought like, I'm going to be on the air and I'm going to be found out. I am going to be exposed for not knowing as much as I should about this sport. So I have made it, if I've made it at all, uh, I've made it because there's some fear in there that I know if I don't over-prepare for all of these sports every single day, that I don't, I don't get to come back and do it again the next day. So um, it's nice that you think that we could have a really nice <laughs> chat about cycling or international sports, and maybe we could, uh, but I mostly have taught myself uh, to get to the point where I feel prepared in something that whether it was a month before or a year before that I was in no way prepared to do. I would think the Premier League mm. would be the biggest thing where you could be afraid because – I mean, even to the people who work here at Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park who are Premier League fans, yeah. they take it so seriously. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're not on spot with that, yes. you can be found out in a hurry. Yeah, and you would appreciate this, Mike. The first thing I do before I get into anything of the particulars of the storylines, the pronunciations of the teams and the players and Tot- the towns and the stadiums. <laughs> exactly, yeah. because the first time you say something like that wrong – it's over. It's over. So if, if I'm doing something for Man City, which, I mean, they're the champions and they are the team, if I say Pep Guardiola's name wrong, the, the, the manager, I'm out. Nobody will listen to me anymore. So that's part of the fear, and it's also part of the knowledge of knowing that the people that like it, the Tour de France in cycling, the Premier League in soccer, they love it. And if they don't accept you as being on the inside in the earliest way, uh, or the, 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 I guess the most common way to be found out as someone who's not one of them, you don't deserve to be talking about it on TV, is to have the pronunciations and the names and the cities wrong. So I always, I always start in that spot. I bet you guys have similar notes. I would <laughs> like imagine you guys so. probably have matching word documents somewhere that have pronunciation guides yeah. and numbers and cuz your preparation sounds exactly well, the I mean, same his to me. is a little further than mine with all of this other because I'm just I mean I'm doing football. But no, but I mean I think I think your brains work the same way. As I think you f- I think you fear if uh, when you say a name wrong it it sort of makes you an imposter. Yeah. Right. Unless you've heard it pronounced a certain way, you know, like Nick like w- Nick Westbrook, Westbrook Akina. Akina. We we were told it was pronounced Nick Westbrook Akina, and then during one of the COVID years, he changed it. Yeah. Because he <laughs> met his father's family. Okay. And they said, "Hey, you're saying it wrong." Mm. So he just casually mentioned to someone that it was Nick Westbrook Akina. And I felt I was devastated because I worked so hard right. on Akina and yeah. and and then it's like 
Nick, could you not have called me and told me? You'd yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not his job, obviously. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal because you want to – be as accurate as you can for the fan base too, right? Right, yeah, exactly. And that those are the basics. And I think um, one of the reasons I've enjoyed this so much, Mike, and one of the reasons probably why you have been good at it for a long time as well, I'm always thinking about ways to be better at it. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you and I have had conversations this entire day, and I'm, I'm taking mental notes. Like, I haven't just asked you about the Titans. I've asked you about your work and who you like out there. I mean, you are, you're a pro's pro. And if, oh, thank you. if there's somebody out there that you think is really good, I'm going to go listen to him to see what I can pick up. So um, I think the, the lifelong curiosity has, uh, has helped a lot. Too. Titans fans, listen up. Open a Titans checking account from Pinnacle with at least $100 and a recurring direct deposit by August the 18th and you could win two tickets to five Titans home games. Details at TitansBanking.com. Titans checking from Pinnacle. Play hard. Bank easy. Member FDIC. All right, speaking of pressure, we're visiting with Paul Burmeister, who has like 47 jobs. (laughs) One of them this August is going to be calling Titans preseason games with Charles Davis on television. We're so excited about him joining us. But he is the voice of Notre Dame football. Yes. There's some pressure in that, Paul. Yeah, some really fun pressure. Okay. Probably the same kind of pressure you feel, but yeah. I mean, I'm very aware that Notre Dame football has the, the kind of cachet and the history where there's a lot of people listening. And I find that to be a really fun kind of pressure uh, because I know it matters. There's a lot of people out there who have designed their day. They can't be at the stadium, and you probably feel the same way. They can't be in South Bend or wherever we're playing on that weekend. But for those three hours, they are going to listen, and they're counting on me to let them know what's going on. And I, I do feel that as pressure and responsibility, but it comes out internally for me as fun. It's a fun prep during the week. It's a fun thing to feel in the booth that I don't want to let anybody down. There might be someone who's the biggest Notre Dame fan in the world. They're driving their daughter to soccer, and they've got 15 minutes to catch up on the game. I don't want to screw that up. I mean, that's an important 15 minutes of that person's day because of how much they love that program. Uh, So it's a fun kind of pressure to me to think about how many people uh, want to have the right picture painted of what's going on. What was it like the day you got the call that you were going to be the voice of Notre Dame football? It's funny. We were just talking about the Tour de France because it happened – It happened late in the summer, and I was on, like, stage 18, and they were going to interview me, and I was in the Pyrenees. And I'm like, my first thought, how am I going to have reception to people back in the (laughs) States where we are literally out here in the the middle of nowhere in the mountains? And I found a spot, like, in between our set and a cliff, and I was talking to them, and I could just tell that it was going very well. And shortly after that, I got the call, and... It was a similar kind of feeling, Mike, because as well as I know football, and I've been broadcasting football on TV for a while, I'd never done a game on the radio. I had never done a single game on the radio. So I knew that I had to get up to speed on the nuance and the particulars. And I called some people that I knew went back and forth between radio and TV, Mike Tirico, Ian Eagle, Kenny Albert, um, Pretty Kevin Pretty good Rolodex. There. Yeah, it's not the, bad. The, those guys were so amazingly helpful. I mean, I, just, I hope at some point I can be that helpful to somebody where I, I know – some, I know so much about something where I can help someone feel like they went from here to here with just the conversation. Those guys could not have been better. I have notes that I look at before every single game from those guys as they told me about, here's what you have to keep in mind when you go from TV to radio. And it was just, just gold in terms of helpful information. Do you like that you have the ability to do both, to do the TV and the radio? I know we talk about it a lot how it uses such different muscles in your brain. Yeah, yes, I enjoy it a lot. And radio, and again, as Mike knows very well, you're talking so much. And I grew up in TV (laughs) where, and it's also kind of a personal thing, I don't like to be the one talking the most. I want my analyst to be the star. I want the game to be the star. and And I'm confident to talk on TV, but if I'm talking more than the other people on TV, I'm doing something wrong. Whereas on radio, 
you have to be the one talking the most. So the amount of energy and the amount of words that come out is much different than when I'm calling something on TV. I've come to like it, but it took a long time to get okay with it because I knew I was talking way more than I was used to. But uh, again, going back to what the guys told me, Mike Tirico told me, he's like, listen, when you're on TV, it's the producer, it's the analyst, it's the game, and then it's you. On the radio, it is you, you, and you, and the analyst can come in a little bit kind of toward the end. And it's not a selfish thing. It's just a reality part of it. So it took some some getting used to. Yeah. When I got into the business years and years ago, the feeling was the number one radio job in the country was Notre Dame. Mm. Even more so than the Yankees, even more so than the Dodgers or the Celtics. And, and I mean, I, I know times change, but it's still, I mean, that is an incredible opportunity understanding their history and their nationwide base, which yeah. at one time they were the only nationwide sure. school because there wasn't as much television. That's changed some, but still fantastic. So I'm interested to know, you and your wife have two sons mm-hmm. who are teenagers. Which of your jobs are they most impressed with? Because mm. if I saw you, I would say, oh, Notre Dame, because I know because of my background and I know what this yeah. is. So I'm fascinated to know yeah. what the people – and the Burmeister household thing. Well, I have been so lucky, Mike, to fall into a couple sports that are my son's favorite sports. Okay. So, so like I, I would think that the Olympics or Notre Dame football or something like that would come up. And it's not like th- they got past the point, And I'm going to throw my wife in there as well, of being impressed by the fact that I was on TV a long time ago. And so uh, I, I lucked into two sports that they both love. So my oldest son uh, plays lacrosse. They just won a state championship at, at their high school. We got the Premier Lacrosse League at NBC from 2019 to th- 2021, right when the league came on the air. And my son was, I think he was in seventh grade then, just falling in love with the sport. And when I heard we were going to get the Premier Lacrosse League, I raised my hand and ran to one of the VPs and said, can I please be a part of this? I will call the games. I will rep- I'll do whatever you want. I knew there would be a a connection for my son to have. And so I got that role, and I had him along with me on the sidelines of games. He's rubbing shoulders with guys he looked up to. As a dad, it was like so awesome to present that to him because I'm gone so often. And to be able to be gone and share his favorite thing with him, that's what he was most impressed with was the Premier Lacrosse League. And just as I got into the Premier League for soccer and got the ass to be part of that hosting team, my youngest son developed a real like, which has become a love now for soccer. And we have really developed that love together and we watch it on tv together now and he thinks i've got a little bit of street cred because i'm talking about (laughs) it on tv (laughs) and so i i can't tell you how fortunate i feel that i fell into two sports that my sons completely love and then i can share it with them because i get to do it as a broadcaster just i'm really glad you asked that question because clearly i love talking about it and again it goes back to the fact that i'm gone a lot i'm gone a lot on weekends i miss things uh, but to be involved in sports that they love has just been such a gift. How does Paul Burmeister keep on the run with 47 different jobs? <laughs> <laughs> well, he visits Duncan. When you join our, I, I don't Mike, know he, it was I, so I, good. He lives in the Northeast. I'm sure They're everywhere. It every was corner. so good. When you join the new Duncan Rewards Program, you can start saving and stacking your way to free Duncan. Then use your points on free things like donuts for your children or coffee that you need or do something nice for your spouse or your neighbor or pretty much anywhere else. Use your rewards points on breakfast sandwiches and then say, I'm sorry for that thing that I did. That's what it says here. Join Duncan Rewards today. Save them, stack them, use them however you want. America runs on Duncan. Terms apply. Speaking of somebody who has to be nice to is Charles Davis. Yeah. Yes, let's talk about Charles, please. How yeah. long have you known Charles Davis? So I have known of Charles. Let's go back to 2006. 2006, so my first three years at NFL Network, I was hosting shows out of NFL Films. And as the network was growing up, they wanted everything to take, take place in L.A. So I started flying to L.A. every weekend for a college football show every Saturday. And my executive producer that summer said, hey, we just signed somebody in the college football world that is great. You're going to love him. Uh, super nice guy, really good, Charles Davis. And I, I have to admit, CD, don't be mad. I'm like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know Charles in 2006. And so then the first time I threw to Charles, he was calling a game at Washington State. I was in the studio. I teed him up. And he made a reference to a Bill Murray line in stripes like that. 
And I'm like, huh, I might, I might kind of like this guy. <laughs> if we're going to be making strides. Do you remember which from, Bill Murray li- line? He, it, was, uh, it was from Sergeant Holka who was talking the to Bill toe? Murray. He's like, something about blown up, sir. And I'm like, how did, how did he get from my team to him? Where is your sergeant? Blown, you're blown up, up, sir. sir. Well yes, done. Yes, you. we can yes. hang out with you as well. Yes. Oh, my God. And that started a, a pretty good relationship. And he and I worked together really closely during the draft, senior bowls, the combines for years. And uh, he's somebody that I liked right away personally and somebody I developed a really strong respect for. And I said this to you, Mike, earlier. Charles being on the number two team at CBS, he's not supposed to be there. He belongs there, Mm -hmm. and he ought to be there for the long term. But there wasn't an industry, industry job waiting for Charles Davis after being a decent player at Tennessee and getting released in training camp from the, from the Cowboys. The things he has done and the amount of work he has done to get to that point is so commendable and easy to respect. Uh, his wife uh, sent out uh, some notes to his close friends to celebrate Charles. I think it was his 25th, uh, 25th anniversary in the industry. And she said, just write whatever you want to Charles. And I thought a long time about it because there's so many funny things I could say to him. We, we've had so many laughs together and so many shows together. And I really spent some time thinking about it because when, when Charles comes up, people talk about how kind he is. Mm-hmm. And it is 100% damn true. He is as nice as a person could be. And, of course, it helps him not only stay at a place but, but ascend because he treats people that, that way. But I, I wrote to him. I said, Charles, this is not about you being nice as why you are up here it's because you are really damn good Mm -hmm. you're nice yes and that's great that's why we're buddies but you have ascended to where you are because you are incredibly good at what you do and charles works uh, i'm going on and on about charles but like okay i I mentioned the word scared like sometimes i'm being a little bit scared can push you into being over prepared charles knows how this business works He knows there are people around waiting to take all of our jobs if and when we don't do it the right way, and he prepares. We don't talk about that, but I know that's in his head. He prepares in a way where he knows how this works, and he needs to do it this well, not most of the time, but every single time. So easy guy to like as a buddy, uh, maybe even more easy to respect as a professional. Having someone like that that you work with so often and have such a good relationship with, has to help you also when you're preparing for something new like this role with Mm -hmm. the Tennessee Titans. How much will you be able to work with him and kind of, because he's been doing this for a while, Charles has been around the Titans organization in different capacities for a long time. How much will you lean on him to help you prepare and kind of get ready for your first preseason with the Titans? A lot and all the time. And I've been around enough to where I'm used to getting ready for something when I don't have a sage and a buddy like Charles on the inside to help me. But when I do, I'm going to take advantage of that. So from being inside the building here today to to interacting with Coach Rabel and the players, I will make a call to Charles every single time because uh, I would like to be like him. I would like for people to describe me this way, but I know that he knows all the particulars and the nuance of how people think and what's important to them as they're trying to Uh, decide if they're going to respect somebody as a pro or not. So I I will lean on him a lot. Um, I I wish I had him as a partner in in every little thing I do. Yeah. But this is one of the reasons you wanted to do Titans preseason was to sort of get back together with him and work in this way. 100%. And Charles and I got to work together all the time for all those years at NFL Network. And we have joked in all the years since, hey, Someday we're going to work together again. I didn't really know that we would actually get to. Uh, and when it seemed like there could potentially be an opportunity here, uh, any the, the 31 other jobs as the preseason play-by-play person are terrific jobs too. Sure. But with my buddy Charles, I mean, it was, it was one of those things where I'm like, okay, at some point along the way, this is going to get tripped up. I'm, I'm not going to get to be in an organization like this with all the exciting things they have going on with perhaps my best friend in the, in the business Am I really going to get to do that? And uh, the fact that it worked out, um, one of the reasons, maybe the lead reason I'm so excited about it is I get to stand next to Charles for those three nights, uh, those three times in the preseason. Paul Burmeister is our guest on the OTP. We've got to take just a quick break to remind you it's official. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. That's right. The deal is finalized, and SeatGeek is the newest member of the Titans family. If you haven't heard the name yet, get used to it because you'll be hearing it a lot more this season. 
Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. may not know this, Paul Burmeister played against Mike Vrabel in college. I did not know this. Buckeyes, Hawkeyes. Ooh. The, the way back when. And uh, every single Ohio State team was so loaded with, with, with players. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could go the D-line to the linebackers to the DBs. And, uh, yeah, known of Mike for, for a long, long time. Yeah. That's so incredible. So you were a senior quarterback at Iowa. Yes. When he was a freshman defensive end at Ohio State. Do you have any recollection of him from that one game? I don't – so Mike may have been – it might have been his very first year. Okay. So I remember Big Daddy Wilkinson playing nose guard and like Steve Tovar playing Steve linebacker. Steve Tovar, yeah. And there was an outside linebacker that got picked by the Browns in the first round. Uh, maybe Powell? Was there, or, okay. Uh, I'll believe you. I don't sure, remember yeah. – I don't remember if Mike was out there or not or if he was in his very first year. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I knew of Mike at Ohio State for sure. Yeah. yeah, certainly a remarkable career. And it's been a remarkable career for him already with the Titans as the head coach. His ascent is something we don't spend a lot of time talking about because he's now been here six years. But this guy didn't even start coaching football until 2011. Right. It's yeah. crazy. That is not very long ago. No. No, and no it isn't. And he's a veteran head coach, <laughs> he's too. He's a veteran head coach. Like he's well, a he's one of the coach. longer tenured head coaches in the league now. That is, that is just crazy. And uh, just from watching one practice, and it's so much fun to go to practice. You can put your eyes on so many different things and learn. Uh, but watching Mike Vrabel, and I made a point to, to watch Mike in the time that I spent out there. And I wrote down, practice starts, he's got his hands on his knees, he's five feet from the wide receivers. He is spending time with the wide receivers. Not a walk-by glance, okay, those guys look okay. He was in it with them at the start of practice with a group he didn't grow up with. So then uh, he's with the defensive lineman later on in practice working on hand technique. He's in, like, they were in, in a huddle in between things, and I see him in there like actually not like full force demonstrating but showing them some things, talking about things with them. He's watching the quarterbacks for the next 20 minutes all three of them, as close as he can. In sprints, here's what I really liked. He's watching everybody run sprints. He's right there in the middle of them. You know every single player, whether it's a rookie or a vet, they know the head coach is standing right there at the finish line. And he called out three names of players, and it, it, it wasn't Tannehill. Okay, it wasn't guys who were well-known. It was fifth-string guys. He knew their first names and if they were running hard or not. So, like, my first impression, I know of Mike from the outside looking in, but from the first time watching a practice, uh, the range of the way he spends his time and, and his, his talent and energy and the, the way he knows each one of the players, not of them a little bit, but knows their names, it may sound basic. I promise you there are head coaches, quite a few of them at camps, they couldn't tell you the first names of all the players there. And the fact that he was calling out names of guys who were not household names, I made mental note of that. As uh, I don't know how that would come up in a preseason broadcast, but it can come up on my mind as something that impressed me. Well, it's uh, I mean, it just gives you a bigger picture, not only of Mike Vrabel as a coach and as a teacher of men, which is kind of more what he sees himself as, but also of the Tennessee Titans and how this team has gotten to the point that they are within, uh, I mean, coming off of all of these winning seasons and even when things don't necessarily go the way the culture remains the same. Mm -hmm. And Mike Vrabel is such a huge part of that. He the way the that he spends yeah. his time and the things that he does and the way that he engages with his players, he's created that, that when things are really good and things aren't going the way that anybody wants them to, there's a steadiness there yeah. that this team hasn't always had. It's such a key word, steadiness, because players of any sport, especially professionals, want to know that the coach is going to be some version of the same dude mm -hmm. all the time. The ones who have the wide range, that they have a hard time maintaining the players for a long time. And I go back to where he learned with uh, Bill Belichick. And the last couple of seasons, I've called USFL games for NBC. And there are a lot of guys, most of the guys have been in NFL camps. And I always like to, when I talk to them, ask them about, hey, you've been in six camps. Which one made the biggest impression on you? And there was a cornerback for New Jersey last year, and his story or his response to that question, he's like, you know what? I've actually been in seven buildings. So you were one off. And he said there was one head coach because he would be in these buildings for like three or four weeks at a time. He said one head coach knew my name 
and talked to me by using my name every time it was Bill Belichick in New England. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that Mike can do that with all of his players, you know, maybe it's who he is anyway, but I, I think he grew up seeing that example. We always heard the stories that the only guy on those great Patriots teams who was basically allowed to give Belichick the business mm. was Vrabel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That he did a Belichick impersonation and that he would do things in practice and he would say things at times and that Belichick would actually laugh at it. It makes sense when you see Belichick and it certainly makes sense when you see Vrabel now as a coach. Yes. The, the reason that they would bond because Pat Kerwin, who we enjoy talking with. Yeah. I love Pat Kerwin on Sirius XM NFL Radio, Moving the Chains. And Amy and I get a chance to visit with him at the Combine, and I see him at the Senior Bowl. He claims that Mike Vrabel was Bill Belichick's favorite interview ever at the Combine. Really? Did, did you get any intel on, on what exactly went down in that interview? Sort of, but I, I think it was because Pat was in the room. And he just said they just totally connected and that he knew when Mike became a free agent leaving the Pittsburgh Steelers that Belichick was going to sign him just because he was his kind of guy. Yeah. You know, in Pittsburgh, the story was he couldn't get around some really outstanding edge guys to get on the field and that he was told, Bill Cowher told him, he said, if you're going to be a starter, you're probably going to have to go somewhere else. And he did, and the rest is history, and now – He's in the Patriots Hall of Fame, which is incredibly exciting. Um, But you just kind of get the sense that they got each other. And when the teams have practiced against one another, which they will do again next month, you can see it. Yeah. Belichick having the Patriots rookies come over and sing happy birthday to Vrabel. Mm -hmm. Just all of these touches that you just say, okay, they go together somehow in some strange way, because they don't seem to be alike. No, but they fit somehow. They fit. That's yeah. well put. Yeah, and I think they each, they're, they're very tough guys, and they may not give a lot to the media w- when they're talking to them at times, but I think they each appreciate a laugh, and they each really appreciate a sense of humor. And people don't know that about Bill, and maybe they don't know it about Mike, and I don't know Mike hardly at all, but I think they're the kind of guys that not only appreciate toughness, but they appreciate a sense of humor and laughing as well. Well, Mike Vrabel's the kind of guy that can relate to anybody on the planet. Right. He has the ability to find that one touch point that's like, oh, yes, you and I, we agree on this thing over here and that thing over there. And he is able to do that, which is why the players love him so much, because no matter what your background is, no matter where you come from, you can find a touch point with Mike Vrabel. And there's a way that there's a click or a relationship that's formed on something No matter what it is, he is able to do that. And I think that that is a skill set that not everybody has Mm -hmm. and makes him a guy who's able to fit in with a Bill Belichick and every single guy in the locker room and every single person who works in the building. Mike Vrabel can just do that. There aren't a ton of people like that in the world. Fair. Mm -hmm. Paul Burmeister, we are so excited to see you back here next month for preseason football with Charles Davis. Uh, We're excited to have you as part of our family, and thank you so much for taking time with us on the OTP. Thank you very much, and i got to say, you mentioned 47 jobs. Sitting right here, you guys are like celebrities to me now. I've listened to every single OTP since I found out that this might happen for me. Uh, So you guys are really good together. It's a requirement of the job. Yeah, Yeah, well, that and watching my kid. We make Charles Davis do that every time he comes (laughs) in, actually. He has to babysit my kid for a weekend. (laughs) So congratulations. Congratulations, You too. (laughs) Yes, thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for having me. (laughs) For Paul Burmeister and Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, and this is the OTP. Welcome to the OTP.